I'm just back from a few days of hiking the Appalachian Trail with my hiking buddy. Did the section from Daleville, Virginia, up above Glasgow. According to my Fitbit, 193,000 steps. That's what I'm talking about. <clears throat> and um, I think Mark, a.k.a. Turbo, only had like 170,000 steps because I have stubby legs. <clears throat> that was my nickname in high school, stubby. Okay, so moving on. My name is Merle Shank. I'm the lead pastor, and uh, I'm also not just back from a week of hiking the trail, but uh, last month I was out on sabbatical, and I just want to thank the leadership team here at Grace for making a sabbatical something that's possible for the pastoral team, and uh, so I had four weeks where I didn't have to do anything. I did have a a sabbatical overseer who checked in with me before and once during, and I have a, I have a wrap-up review with him, but Paul reads easy. <laughs> um, yeah, see, everyone's laughing, like, what did you talk about? <laughs> Soccer. Um, <clears throat> no, it, it was good. Uh, he was one of the multiple people who really exhorted me that during that four-week season of sabbatical that God wanted to speak some things to me, so be sure and listen. Listen well. So we're going we're gonna to get to that. So with the hike that I just was on this past week and with the sabbatical, with the month of rest that I had last month, I'm refreshed, I'm relaxed, I'm full of enthusiasm to pursue the vision that God's given our church to see thousands saved, healed, and passionately following Jesus. So I'm a goals guy. I like goals. They give me uh, structure, and they give me uh, focus. I had five goals for, I actually started with four goals for my sabbatical. I was going to relax, I was going to rest, I was going to recreate, and I wanted to read. Those were, those were my four R's of sabbatical. Alliteration is a really cool thing. And, uh, and then God added the listen. So rest, relax, recreate, read, and listen. And, and so the first thing I did uh, in, in the relax, rest, and recreate is I watched hours and hours and hours of the Olympics. <clears throat> Anybody want to admit to that besides me, watching <laughs> hours of Olympics? I was one of the 1,000 viewers who watched <laughs> the Olympics, evidently. Uh, not a big thing for you guys. Well, let me save you some time. Don't go back and look at all of the really hundreds of hours that were offered on six or seven different network channels. Just watch the one minute, five second race of the 17 year old Alaskan girl who won the breaststroke. It is the most inspirational thing. So she's this teenage girl, not even out of high school, who swam and made the finals and the whole lead up to that event was she never got mentioned. It was just like uh, this other American's going to win because she won four years ago and she had the best qualifying time. And so the whole first 50 seconds of the race, they're talking about this Lily King girl who's so amazing. And then this Rowdy Gaines guy who used to, he starts shouting in the middle of the broadcast, Look at Lydia Jacoby. Look at Lydia. And, and then she wins in the last 15 meters. And then they cut to little community center in Seward, Alaska, where all of her high school friends and, and people in her community were just going bonkers. They were, they were going crazy celebrating. And I just cried. Shocking. And, <laughs> and I have honestly two dozen times, no exaggeration, watched it, and I keep crying. So I'm going to spiritualize it for you. <laughs> Seriously, when I see this young girl win a race nobody expected, and then I watch all of these people who believed in her and did a watch party, I think every time somebody comes to faith, that's what the angels are doing. 
they just go bonkers because they believed that that person would find faith in Jesus Christ more than that person. It just, you just have to watch it. I tried to get our video team to pull it up, but it, there's copyright issues, and then our whole live stream would be banned, and, and then, then, you know, government takeover of the world would happen, and who, know, who knows what else. So, Asher, Asher is so strict as a producer. Thank you, Asher. So we can't show it, but imagine this 17-year-old redhead just swimming her heart out and winning the race in the last few meters, and then a whole community center full of people for the world. Here's a detail. She trained in a 25-meter pool. They didn't have in her small 2,000 community an Olympic-sized pool for her to train in until her last little bit she went up to Anchorage. It's just crazy. There's a fam, the Herb family or swimmers. They, it's just, it's the most astounding underdog story of the whole. So ignore all of the Olympics. Just watch <laughs> Lydia Jacoby win the gold medal and her, her community go bonkers. I think I'll post it on my Facebook before the day's over and you just go look at it. And you'll say, yeah, Merle was right. So I slept a lot because I was watching Olympics past midnight because <laughs> because it was all pre-recorded up into that point. And then at midnight, because they're 14 hours different, then you started seeing the morning events live. And who can stop watching then? <laughs> all right, so I slept a lot. I shot clay targets with a friend. I did some other target shooting. I read at a cabin that a friend offered. I participated in a two-day Global Leadership Summit. I demolished our old 30-year-old rotting storage shed. And then I uh, assembled a new one with a friend. And here's the highlight of my sabbatical last month. Uh, Sue and I visited five different local churches throughout the valley, and we saw the variety and the beauty and the glory and the strength of the body of Christ in our community, and it is wonderful to be a part of this. The, the, the church of God in Harrisonburg is strong and well, church, and we're part of that. So that was, that was an unexpected gem that, that we enjoyed. And then the highlight uh, for me personally came at the silent retreat that I took at the monastery up at Holy Cross Abbey in Berryville for four days. They offer three-day uh, weekend retreats, and they offer five-day week uh, Monday through Friday retreats. But I left on Thursday because silent retreat I do well, but I don't do well without electricity and, and air conditioning. <laughs> They, lost, they had thunderstorms every day and lost power on Thursday, and I just bolted. <laughs> because I was on sabbatical, and I didn't have to do anything. Right. <laughs> it's real freedom. <laughs> well, God spoke to me, uh, and I do enjoy solitude, and I do enjoy silence, and I am a bit of an introvert. And God sh showed me a number of things. Uh, I wish I could share all of them. He's, he's been speaking to me about humility and about repentance uh, over the past year. But I want to share something that's, that's really current and fresh from the last few weeks and month. And um, the first thing, and this is, this is just a personal little insight I learned, is that it didn't take me any time at all to kick life into neutral and to really chill. I can, I can be lazy quickly. And I realized that not since I had been in college a few, few years back, not since I had been in college had I had four weeks where I never had to do anything. And um, so college students in the room, let me just tease you a little bit. I know that your life is full. You're super busy. You're incredibly productive. You go to every class. You read every assignment. You turn in every paper. You pull all-nighters to cram for tests. Your life is wall-to-wall -wall studying, and you're making the most of every dollar mom and dad are spending putting you through college. I know that's the truth, but here's some more truth. You have more discretionary time on your hands right now than you will ever have again in your life. So... So there, you are so brave. I love that interaction. So listen to wisdom as it speaks. 
appreciate this season, embrace it, enjoy it, be grateful for it, and just don't waste it. It is a gift. Um, okay, so I do have a lot of things I want to share, but the, the thing I want to focus on are, is going to be encompassed in two words here. And those two words are listen, repeat that for me, listen and obey, obey, listen, obey. Those two words are going to encompass everything else I share. Listen, obey. So, as I said, I started my sabbatical with a number of people giving me that exhortation. Listen, I believe God has some things he wants to, to share with you. So you can imagine as I was reading my Bible, as I was taking walks, as I was practicing solitude and silence, I was doing my best to listen well to whatever and however God wanted to speak to me. So here's, here's a, a passage that I found encouraging me in this listening process from Proverbs 8. You can follow along on the screens. Now then, my children, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. There it is right there. Listen to me, keep my ways, obey. Listen to my instruction and be wise. Do not disregard it. Blessed are those who listen to me, watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway. For those who find me, find life and receive favor from the Lord. That's such a promise. That's such good news. So the whole chapter of 8 Proverbs 8 is wisdom being personified as a person. And if you will embrace wisdom, if you will listen to wisdom, to you college students, you know, listen to God's wisdom, then you will be blessed. You will have life. You will receive favor from the Lord. That's such a promise. So I was tuned in and I was listening as well as I could. And God did speak to me, and one of the things he spoke to me through the course of the sabbatical was from a book that I was reading. I did do a lot of reading. I achieved that goal. I, I finished multiple books. By the way, there is a Revolution of Character book by Dallas Willard that we should all read, and, and it'll transform us all, and it'll, it'll literally save the world. <laughs> now, I, it, is, it is the best book I've read on being transformed into the image of Christ. Um, it's just really good. So I read that book, read a bunch of good books, but the book I want to uh, reference now is by Dietrich Bonhoeffer and it's called The Cost of Discipleship. Some of you read that and you're like, uh-oh. Um, it does mess you up, it messed me up. It was so convicting in good ways. It, it made me want to get save all over again or wonder if I had been. So he, he, he coins a phrase in his, his book as he writes about inward piety and, and inward piety not being a great thing. His inward piety talks about as being in our hearts and our minds, we embrace the teaching and words of Jesus, but we don't really obey them. So we, we give mental assent or we give emotional agreement to what Jesus is saying, but we don't really obey it. And uh, inward piety sounds a little dated to me, so I came up with my two words, and it's called partial obedience. Do you ever settle for that in your life? I got a chuckle already. So, so I, I found myself somehow. I have fallen into I have fallen into this mode of partial obedience, and when we do that, we make excuses like this: "Well, I really meant well," or. I did do the first part right. Doesn't that count? Or you don't know how hard I tried. Or even it wasn't my fault. These other people messed me up. Blame shifting, not being accountable or responsible for our own actions. That's partial obedience kinds of symptoms. So every parent in the room right now knows that partial obedience isn't obedience at all, right? Uh, the parenting group in first service were way more engaged. <laughs> so partial, yeah, our partial obedience isn't obedience. So 
Here's an example. Uh, go to your room and pick everything up. And so partial obedience looks like two socks hit the hamper and we think we're done. Maybe you didn't have a child like that. But that's what we, we do a few things and then, well, that's good. That's, that's not obedience. Another look at what isn't obedience is deferred or delayed obedience. That isn't really obedience either, right? Son, go out, go walk the dog. It needs to be walked right now. A couple hours later, dog hasn't been walked. Nasty mess that some adult is taking care of. Never happens in your house, I hope. It didn't in ours because we did not have pets. <laughs> Love animals. Actually, hate snakes. Just random. <laughs> no, no, I just, I just realized I blew through my well-crafted introduction. <laughs> I haven't preached in two months, Mike. Can you tell? <laughs> so I did have a wonderful hike. <laughs> Don't back up, babe. I've got a cue card. Partial obedience is not obedience. Delayed obedience is not obedience. But somehow it's easy to drift into excusing that. I think we can just blame COVID still, right? Partial obedience, COVID's fault, boom. I'm having too much fun. Come on. Hey, you better come tonight because we are going to party. <laughs> like, this is just a warm-up. All right. Jesus encourages us to obey in this way. At the end of this one parable, he says, Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds their house on solid rock. We're, some of us are familiar with that story. Listens and follows. Listen and obey, church. Listen and obey Jesus. Listen to Jesus. Obey Jesus. Here's Jesus again in another response. He says, blessed are all who hear the word of God and put it into practice. Luke eleven twenty eight. 28. Blessed are all who hear the word of God and put it into practice. Who hear and apply it. James, the brother of Jesus, gets even more direct. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Don't deceive yourselves. Don't listen and act like that's obedience. Listen and do what it says. Obey. So God is, is teaching me in this season to listen and to obey. Here's a Dietrich Bonhoeffer quote from The Cost of Discipleship. The actual call of Jesus and the response of single-minded obedience, I love that phrase, single-minded obedience, have an irrevocable significance. By means of them, Jesus calls people into an actual situation where faith is possible. It is only through actual obedience that a man can become liberated to believe. Obedience liberates us to believe and have faith. Faith is obedience. Obedience is faith. That's what I'm learning in this. That's what God's been teaching me. Faith is obedience. Obedience is faith. We can sing wonderful songs, and we've done that this, this morning. We can pray pretty prayers. We can read the Bible daily. We can sacrifice hours and, and dollars to the church and other charities. We can hear sermons each week and all through the week. We can say what we think God and other people want to hear, but our faith in Jesus and our love for God is proven by our obedience. Boom, hashtag tweet. I am having a lot of fun. I missed you guys. <laughs> it isn't enough that we want to obey. We must obey. 
Here's, here's how Jesus says it in this parable. Matthew 21, 28. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in that vineyard. I will not, the son answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said to the, the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir, but he did not. Which of the two did what his father wanted? It's not a trick. Which one? The first one. The first one gave a bad answer, but obeyed. The second one gave the right words, but didn't do it. So then Jesus goes on to say this. Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. He's speaking to religious leaders. He said, look, these prostitutes, these tax collectors, these Auskak, the, the Merles and the Sus, and all of us are entering the kingdom after rejecting God and being far from him because they repented, they changed, and came to believe Jesus. They, they received the message. We started out wrong, but we ended up repenting and following Jesus. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you, you religious leaders, saw this, you did not and repent and believe him. You are the second son, religious leaders. You said, you, you spend your life memorizing the word. You spend your life worshiping daily in the temple. And then you reject Jesus when he shows up. Wrong choice. So when Jesus reveals himself to us, the answer is yes. Listen and obey. So God's been encouraging me to share with you what he's been teaching me here in this past month and a half, focusing on listen to Jesus, church. Obey Jesus completely and immediately not partially not delayed I have this concern that many of us are settling for partial obedience or even just blatant disobedience we, we think things like this I'll just ask God to forgive me and he will or it really isn't that important. I'm sure he'll just be gracious and overlook it. It looks like this. We'll read a really challenging passage of scripture like love your enemies. And then we'll dilute that and say something to ourselves like this. I'm sure he didn't really mean it that way. That's a little too extreme. I want to read a, a parable story. Mark 10, this is a rich young man who comes to Jesus looking how to inherit life. I'll read this quickly. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, Squishy just ran through those for us, right? You know these commandments. Teacher, he declared, I have kept all of these since I was a boy. Uh, let's just pause. This guy's more amazing than all of us. Okay? I've not kept all of these since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. He gave him a command. Do this, follow me. He listened, and here's what he did. The man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Our partial obedience, our deferred obedience, our watering down obedience would be like, well, he didn't, he didn't really want the guy to sell all of that. He just wanted him to not let it be attached as an idol in his heart. Isn't that, isn't that kind of the process we go through? Some, may, okay, maybe it's just me. 
Jesus didn't literally mean to sell everything he had and come follow him. Well, that's what, he, that's what he told the other disciples. They left their nets, Peter, Andrew, and they followed him. Matthew left his tax booth and followed Jesus. He left everything. Follow Jesus. This is what Bonhoeffer says that I found particularly challenging and convicting. The difference between ourselves and the rich young man is that he was not allowed to solace his regrets by saying, never mind what Jesus says, I can still hold on to my riches, but in a spirit of inner detachment, keep them. Despite my inadequacy to obey, I can take comfort in the thought that God has forgiven me my sins and I can have fellowship with Christ in faith. But no, he went away sorrowful because he would not obey, he could not believe. Obedience is faith, faith is obedience. He went away from Jesus and indeed this honesty had more promise than any apparent communion with Jesus based on disobedience. I went ahead and wrote a paraphrase of that. I, honestly, I read that three times and said, what is he saying? <laughs> and here's what I think he's saying. Bonhoeffer is saying, the rich young ruler's no to Jesus was at least honest. And it was preferable to any apparent relationship we think we have with Jesus when it's based on disobedience. It's actually preferable and there's more promise for us to be honest with God and say no thank you than it is to say yes and not obey. Yeah, it challenged me like crazy. Church, I, I, I want you to hear this. We cannot follow Jesus by adding him to our overflowing lives. Jesus will not be added to our numerous other interests that matter more to us. When Jesus speaks to us, the answer must be yes. When Jesus says, follow me, the best answer is yes. And then wholeheartedly follow, obey, immediately single-mindedly. Whatever Jesus asks us to do, may we promptly obey. Anything else is disobedience and ultimately death. The message paraphrase says it in really colorful paraphrase. Here's Matthew 8, 18. It's on the screens for you. When Jesus saw that a curious crowd was growing by the minute, he told his disciples to get him out of there to the other side of the lake. And as they left, a religion scholar asked if he could go along. I will go with you wherever, he said. Jesus was curt. Are you really ready to rough it? We're not staying in the best inns, you know. He could tell this person had a warm thought about following Jesus, but really didn't want to sacrifice or, or face the difficulty ahead. We're not staying in the best inns, you know. We're camping. Another follower said, Master, excuse me for a couple of days, please. I have my father's funeral to take care of. Jesus refused. First things first. Your business is life, not death. Follow me. Pursue life. There's some compassionate people in here who are just going, that's harsh. Did Jesus really say that? Eugene Peterson did a bad paraphrase. I'm sure he didn't say that. <laughs> Pursue life. Your business is life. Follow me. Pursue life. Church, do whatever Jesus says to do. It will always be life if we follow Jesus. Even if we cannot understand, even if what he says is mysterious or seems harsh, if we obey Jesus, we will find life. Going our own way produces death. So perhaps when I read these, these stories and Jesus calling and, and demanding people to follow him, we think that's just radical discipleship that was necessary to get things started back in the day. But I, I want to read something that I received 
from one of the missionary uh, partners that we have. It's called Run. They're Reaching Unreached Nations. They're an amazing ministry that we began to partner with in the last year. And, and in light of current events, this person wrote uh, just a powerful encouragement that ri- radical obedience and radical discipleship is as relevant today as it was when Jesus was calling his disciples. Here's, here's a note that I pray will encourage you. Joanna, you could play. That would be beautiful. In the natural today, 9-11, this was written yesterday. In the natural, 9-11 brings a lot of different emotions for many of us. Why? Well, exactly 20 years ago, America survived the worst terrorist attack in the history of our country. And about 20 days ago, the U.S. government handed Afghanistan back to the perpetrators of that atrocity. During the in-between, many of our dearest friends sacrificed their lives for our safety. While on deployment to Afghanistan, they missed seeing the birth of a child, the first day of school, watching a son play ball or an instrument, or a daughter excel on the field or in the classroom. We all know that freedom is not free, and I honor all those who have served our nation. In the middle of this dark and confusing moment, I want to humbly share some good news that I believe was born from the praying parents who sent their sons and daughters to the land, to the land of the sand, and that has grown to what might be one of the strongest forces for hope our world has ever known. Over the last few years, I have, this is the the head of this ministry speaking, I have personally interviewed more than 150 former Taliban and Al-Qaeda fighters who have left their radical Islamic faith and turned to the love and the love and forgiveness of Jesus. Some were in major cities, others from farms. They were businessmen, clerics, translators, bankers, students. They all shared these these three things in common. Each one of these 150 former terrorists, these former bad guys, encountered God, encountered Jesus in a vision. Through angelic visitations, through voices from heaven, through vivid visions of Jesus, these men all knew at once they were guilty in the presence of the Almighty. Each one of these 150 former bad guys saw the Jesus film. It was produced in 79 and now translated to more than 1,600 languages. These known killers saw Jesus, sensed his love, witnessed his death on the cross, and recognized that he lives forever to return for his faithful. Can we thank God for the people who created the Jesus film? Wow. Each one of these 150 former bad guys heard the full gospel through the courageous face-to-face witness of a Jesus follower from their own language and culture. Each one of these 150 former bad guys heard the gospel face-to-face from a radical disciple who said yes to Jesus when Jesus said, follow me. Every presentation of the gospel came with a call to total sacrifice and radical obedience. Why is this such good news? Out of the ashes of of Afghanistan comes a spiritual army of Jesus followers who have memorized much of God's word. Who live by God's command and follow the daily direction of the Holy Spirit. When I look at Afghanistan today, I am not confused or disheartened by current events. I am bolstered by the prophetic call of these very brave Jesus followers who are now going village to village in their own nation today asking people to follow Jesus. Rescuing orphans of this war, moving and caring for families of martyrs, yes, People are dying because they're Christian. The Taliban is going village by village, killing people. 
I've asked these young Afghani Jesus followers to risk everything for their Savior. And I believe God is asking no less from us. Faith is obedience. Obedience is faith. Listen to Jesus, church. Obey Jesus. Well, I believe God has already spoken to some of us who are assembled here and who are listening online. Some of us have fallen into partial obedience mode like I acknowledged, and the Holy Spirit stirring in us to repent and obey. Single-minded, total obedience is what he wants from us. Maybe we've been excusing an addiction. Maybe we've been in a wrong relationship. Maybe we are carrying an offense that God has told us to forgive. Whatever it is, whatever your partial or delayed obedience looks like, give it up. Listen. Obey. I believe some folks here and listening online are being drawn for the first time to follow Jesus, just like those 150 people that this missions leader was testifying of. Say yes to Jesus. Follow him. It's the only way to have life. I want to ask you to stand. I want those who pray to come to the front and be available. If, if you are someone who is, is saying yes to Jesus for the first time today, I want to invite you to come and pray with one of our team. We'd love to know that and give you resources for your journey of faith. Or you can go to the information table and fill out a connect card and let us know that you're starting your journey of faith. Or our online folks, you can, you can click on the connect button on the live stream and, and share the good news with us. We want to follow up and encourage you as disciples and followers of Jesus. So I've called you to listen and obey, and you've really honored me with your attentiveness. I want to, I want to just ask you to pause right now while Joanna's playing, and I want you to listen to the voice of God in whatever way he would like to speak to you. Just open your hearts to the Holy Spirit, church. invited to come forward, let me just pray a blessing and benediction over you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for calling each of us to follow you. I bless you, church, with hearts that are quick to say yes to God. I bless you with courage to believe and trust Jesus with all your life. I bless you with wholehearted, immediate obedience to God. Listen to Jesus obey Jesus. Let's follow Jesus with all our hearts and all our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you, church. Bless you to go. If you want prayer, please, this team up front is ready to minister.